kind of give you a quick, uh, quick report on our March break trip. Uh, I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you very much for praying. Uh, we appreciate it. We definitely um, felt and saw the, the effect of your prayers. Um, as, uh, as Pastor Boss was preaching this morning, some of the, some of the trials that come your way, um, as we do our best to be stewards and make plans, there are plenty of times when in the middle of those plans you realize that your plans are not headed the direction God's plans are. And uh, we did that. We were headed down towards, we were supposed to meet um, a Bob Jones coach bus. They were going to send a bus about 10 hours up to Philadelphia. We were going to drive to Philadelphia, meet them, and ride in comfort the rest of the way to South Carolina. Um, and because of a nor'easter that was coming up through up to the, the eastern seaboard, um, Evelyn and Pastor Bart called me, um, I think we were in Massachusetts or New York State, I can't remember which, they said, by the way, the coach bus is not coming. Oh boy. So most of the kids didn't realize at that point, but the Lord and I, while we were driving, just had a little, well, I had a conversation. <laughs> I couldn't hear what he was saying because the God's word wasn't open, um, but it was, uh, it was an opportunity then. We sat down. I appreciate Kathleen was helping and Cliff was driving as well. We stopped at the next rest area and said, all right, we need to regroup and replan. What are we going to do and how are we going to do it? So Cliff said he, he would be able to drive the rest of the way and uh, I, I couldn't be outdone by Cliff. Um, so we, we, uh, we drove the rest of the way. I actually think timing-wise it worked out better. We were able to position our stops a little bit better so that our trip went better. The teens uh, really uh, jumped into. They were a little bit fearful when we arrived on campus when they found out they had to stay alone in a dorm room with actual college students and had to go to more than two classes a day. It was a, it was a, a rude reminder of reality. But they jumped right in, the students there welcomed them, invited them to their classes, and really was a, a great time for them to be able to, to understand and experience what life is like so that when, they are, when they, it's their time to make decisions on where would God have me go for my further education, they can make a wise decision um, as to whether or not God would have them. I know for myself, I had lots and lots and lots of miss. Uh, perceptions of what I thought Bible school was and it's good to be able to be on site to be able to make those uh, uh, have those experiences and grow together and then to spend that many hours together in a vehicle we bond and we grow and God gives us lots of opportunities to just enjoy each other to laugh and to do life in tight spaces and it really is uh, it really is a great time so I appreciate your prayers to the teens for your patience um, with each of us and uh, it was a, a productive week and I'm thankful for the time and I appreciate each of you praying. Um, we missed church for sure. Uh, we were able to listen to a CD, some sermons on the way back on Sunday, but there's, there's nothing that takes the place of being together and, uh, and here we are this evening. So let's pray as we begin our service and then as we'll have time to, to worship and praise our God. Lord, we give thanks to you, um, your way and your plan is perfect. And Lord, it is difficult when, when we do our best to plan and to, to try to be as effective as possible and we realize that you change our plans, but then we have to remember that your way is best, it is perfect, and as we adjust our attitudes and our perspectives, we are then able to see you work through the design that you laid out really before the foundation of the world uh, was created. Lord, it is, it is um, a privilege to be guided and directed by you, even though there are times where it may not be enjoyable at, while we're in it. But as we look back, um, it, is, uh, it is encouraging to know and to be able to understand with clarity that as we respond in faith, not knowing yet exactly what you are doing, you will work in us, you will work through us, and you will change us more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that privilege to be able to be called your sons and daughters and to know that you are directing us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to begin singing this evening with hymn number 622. We're marching to Zion. We get you to stand up and... You can pretend you're marching, but stay in your seats while we sing, all right? We'll sing all four verses. Mm -hmm. 
sweet accord and thus around the throne and thus around the throne we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city Continue singing with him 291, Higher Ground, and again we'll sing all three verses. Thomas Walls, yes, God's blessing the offering. 
sing again. In number 406, The Only One Life. We talked in the first two songs about marching to Zion and going home to heaven. But while we're here, we need to offer our lives to Jesus, my Lord and King. So we'll sing all three verses together of Only One Life. my Lord and King, only one tongue to praise Thee, and of Thy mercy sing, only one heart's devotion, Savior, O may be consecrated. Think about the words that you just sang while you were singing. I know the notes were a little funny sometimes, but you, we just prayed that God would take our life and that we wouldn't hold, withhold anything from our Lord. Hopefully that's true. We'll sing one more time the hymn Channels Only, which I think is a little more familiar in terms of the tune. So I'll get you to stand with me and we'll sing all four verses together of Channels Only. <laughs> Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every Thou canst use us every 
fill now with thy spirit hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst Every day and every hour. Man, you may be seated. I believe, or Dave and Rob, yes, they are. Excellent. Dave and Rob are going to come sing for us. by your door someone may be living stooped with the load and affliction of sin tell them today how Jesus so freely laid down his life the lost sinner to win close by your door close by your door Needing a story so true Could be a neighbor just waiting for someone And that someone, my dear friend, might be you Close by your door, someone may be longing Longing for peace that the world cannot give Show them just now how Jesus in mercy suffered and bled that we truly might live. Close by your door, close by your door, needing a story so true. Could be a neighbor just waiting for some. And that someone, my dear friend, might be you. Close by your door, someone may be passing, never to pass by your way anymore. Will you refuse to tell them of Jesus? Will you not point them to heaven's bright shore? Close by your door, close by your door, needing a story so true. Could be a neighbor just waiting for someone, and that someone, my dear friend, might be. gentlemen. It was a great uh, challenge. I, I was thinking I had a, a teacher in Bible school that would, he would challenge us. He said, walk slowly through the crowd. And uh, what he meant by that was to just, don't just go busily about doing all the things that you have to do on the day, but just kind of keep your eyes out for people who, who are needy and to think about others and to think outward. And that was a great reminder in that song. I really appreciate that, uh, Dave and Rob. Would you join me in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, Ephesians chapter four tonight? And uh, you're in for a special treat tonight because tonight you're going to listen in as I preach to myself. And uh, I'm not going to endure this alone. Um, Pastor Bart and Andy have already warned them. I'm going to hammer them too uh, tonight. And I thought about putting them right down in the front row so I can uh, really give it to them, and you can just sit back and enjoy all this. But but I, I want to I need to see these guys tomorrow morning at eight. So I uh, I. We'll told them they can, they, they can sit with their wives, but I'm excited to preach this passage because it, it really helps us to understand God's masterful blueprint for the church. And if we as a church, pastors, and every believer, every member in this church will fully grasp God's design for us in terms of how we ought to function and what we all are to be doing, 
there really are virtually no limits to what God can do in and through the ministry of this body. The actual passage we'll discuss tonight is Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12, but since it's been a couple of weeks since we have been in this section of Scripture, why don't we read starting in verse 7, and then we'll continue down to verse 16 to sort of set the context. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Dear Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to help us to hunger for the truth that is in this passage, to help us to apprehend the truth that is in this passage, and then to know how clearly, clearly how to apply it to our lives. So I pray that you will help me to be clear in just lifting out from the text what is actually here, and that alone. And may we all be blessed because of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text tonight is the beginning of a new sentence that will continue down to verse 16, starting in verse 11 and down to verse 16, but it does, verse 11 does start with the transition word and. And so we know that this passage is not to be seen in isolation. In the previous verses, in verses 7 through 10, we encounter this somewhat mysterious but fascinating passage that informs us that Jesus Christ, by descending to the earth, conquering sin and the grave, ascended like a champion. Who is a, like a general who has overcome all of his enemies, he ascended back up into heaven. And he has taken with him spoils of war. And the spoils of war are to be understood in two different ways. The spoils of war, the captives that he has made captive, are those believers, those individuals that he has rescued from the dominion of Satan. We as believers have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and we have become slaves of Christ. Whereas we were former slaves of Satan, we are now slaves of Christ. We who are in bondage to death have now been seized by life. And it's such a rich picture, this idea of the the captivity being made captive. Those who were held captive by sin and Satan are now held captive by Christ. But verse 8 The spoils of war are also to be seen as the gifts that Christ has shared with those whom he has freed from the power of Satan. So verse 7, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In verse 7, Christ has given to everyone in the church a gift. Everyone has been endowed with a gift that Christ has acquired through his triumphs over sin and death and the grave. And he is now distributing those gifts back to his church so that his church, who has been rescued from the clutches of Satan, is now able to perform works of ministry that are pleasing to God. And as we have discussed a few weeks ago, because the gifts that we have all been given have been purchased at such an incredible cost to Christ, we, we dare not bury our gifts. We dare not hide our gifts under a bushel, so to speak. We we dare not just sit and observe and just come to church to be entertained and just to observe. We ought to be busily using our gifts in ministry. That's what Christ has given them to us for. 
And if any one of us fails to use our gifts and ministry here, we will personally suffer loss when we stand before Christ at the judgment seat. But not only will we personally suffer loss at the judgment day, but here in this day, the church will suffer loss. Because the church needs your gift. The church needs you to serve and to use the abilities that God has given to you in ministry here in this body. And we are suffering loss if you are not using your gifts. Now what happens in verse 11 is that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, provides for us an example of some of the gifts that God has given to the church. There are other lists and other places in the New Testament that give us more gifts that Christ has given to the church. We find lists in Romans chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in 1 Peter chapter 4. But what is mentioned specifically in Ephesians 4 are the gifts of leadership that Christ has given to the church. Three points to consider tonight. Would you note first with me the provision of the gifts in verse 11? And in that verse, four specific gifts are listed. And if you do the math in verse 11, you will actually count. It seems that there are five. You might think that I missed one by saying four. But as we'll see, those last two that are listed in verse 11 are really combined into one gift. And we'll quickly go through each and define each of these gifts gifts that Christ has given to the church. First in verse 11, the apostles. The apostles. Verse 11, it says that Christ gave some apostles. Now, we have this word apostles. There is a a general and a specific understanding of this word apostles. Generally, the word just simply means a sent one. And so if we're saying an apostle is just someone who is sent, it is a very general application really to all believers. Every believer has been sent to do something. Every believer has been gifted by Christ to do something, and then they are sent out into the world to do ministry. And so in that sense, any Christian could be considered an apostle. We are all sent to do Christ's work in the world. And this word is used plenty in the New Testament to note note that understanding. But there's also a very specific understanding of the word apostle. And that specific sense refers to those men who were commissioned directly by the risen Lord Jesus Christ to perform specific acts of ministry that were foundational to the church. We could call these the capital A apostles. These were men who had seen the risen Christ and had received a specific appointment directly from him. The 12 disciples would fit this bill. They saw Jesus, they saw the resurrected Christ, and they were commissioned by Christ to do specific acts of ministry ministry that were foundational to the church. You may recall that in Acts chapter 1, because Judas had hung himself and he was off the scene, that the disciples added one other disciple, Matthias, to take his place. And these were all apostles. And then, of course, there is Paul, who met the risen Christ at the road to Damascus, and he was commissioned directly by Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He he called himself, he is the apostle who was born out of due time. And these capital A apostles were used by God to plant churches all across the Roman Empire. And God used them also uh, to, to, to record much of the New Testament that we have in our laps here tonight. Now I'll show you why in a moment that I think that Paul has these capital A apostles in mind here in verse 11. But before I do, notice the second gift that is mentioned in verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets. Now the prophets specifically refer to that gift that Christ gave to the early church to reveal New Testament truth to the church. If you think about it, if you lived as a Christian in the first century in Jerusalem or in Ephesus or in Philippi or wherever you happened to be, and all you had was the Old Testament, you would be limited in what you knew about how to do church how to live as a New Testament believer under grace. We would, if, we were, if, if, if we were without the New Testament scriptures, we would not be functioning the way that we are today. Would we have pastors and deacons? Would we, have, would we be celebrating the Lord's table the way that we do today? Would we be baptizing believers by immersion? Would we understand what our relationship to the Old Testament laws was? So how did the church knew what to do? How did the church know what to do for those early years after Pentecost until the New Testament was written? 
Well, God gave this gift of prophets. Christ gave this gift of prophets to instruct the, the early churches about how to function until the New Testament was formulated. Now, these first two gifts that Paul mentions here in verse 11 have been mentioned together before in Ephesians. Can you remember where? If you go back to chapter 2, there's actually a couple of places where you see this duo of apostles and prophets referenced in Ephesians, and it's important to see how Paul uses them in these other places. Ephesians chapter 2, notice in verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and notice, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple unto the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now this passage is what leads me to believe that Paul in chapter 4 has these capital A apostles and capital P prophets in mind. When they are grouped together here in chapter 2, they are said to have served foundational roles. They are foundational in verse the foundation of apostles and prophets. And it's a, it's a great illustration. When you lay a foundation for a house, you lay one foundation, and then you build other materials on top of that foundation. And that's the idea. Christ is the cornerstone of the church, and in the first century, he commissioned apostles and prophets to lay that initial foundation, and for the last two millennia, there have been people who have been being saved and added to this superstructure, this, this holy habitation of God, the church. And just as that foundation, the foundation in the house, once it's laid, is no longer needed. So in the early church, once that foundation is laid by the apostles and prophets, you don't need to lay another foundation. This gift that Christ gave to the early church was one that was used. The church was formulated. Churches were planted all over the Roman Empire. The New Testament was written down and inscripturated for generations to come. And their legacy now lives on through the New Testament. This duo of apostles and prophets will come up again in chapter 3. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by the revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The main function of these first century apostles and prophets was to reveal the mystery of the gospel. This was not known by the Old Testament prophets. They knew something was coming, but they weren't totally sure what it was. And in the first century, Christ gave these gifts of apostles and prophets to, to unleash the mysteries of the gospel. And certainly they did other things besides reveal the mysteries to the church, but their lasting contributions is the mystery of the gospel, the New Testament that you're holding in your lap tonight. And certainly you can have little a apostles still around today. And regarding prophets, I suppose you could have little p prophets, if you want to understand it this way, people that are taking truth that has already been revealed, that has already been given, not taking new truth like the prophets in the first century were, but taking truth that is already revealed and proclaiming it. If you want to understand prophets in that light, you could say that there are little a apostles and little p prophets today. But when Paul refers to apostles and prophets in Ephesians, as he does in several places, he is referring to this unique group of people in the first century who revealed the New Testament truth to the church. They laid the foundation, and since that foundation has been laid, they no longer exist in any official capacity. So back to Ephesians 4 and verse 11. He gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets. And now these next two that are introduced in Ephesians are introduced for the first time, giving us the clear impression that they are to be seen as different from the first two. Letter C, evangelists. He gave some apostles, prophets, and some evangelists. You say, what is an evangelist? You might be surprised to see how infrequently this word is used in the New Testament. 
You know, this word actually shows up three times in the New Testament. That's it. Um, and we do well to observe them. Can you turn to um, Acts chapter 21 for just a moment? Acts chapter 21. I'll show you one place here where you find this word evangelist. Paul has just left Tyre in Acts chapter 21, and he's traveling to a place called Caesarea. And there's a man there named Philip. And notice how the man Philip is described in Acts 21. And down in verse 8, it says, Paul's telling his story here, and he says, In the next day, we that were of Paul's, I'm sorry, Luke's telling this story about him and being on accompanying Paul on the journey, but verse 8, And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the who? The evangelist, which was one of the seven, and we abode with him. Now, There are a couple of Philips in the New Testament. There is a Philip that you read about in the Gospels. We've seen him actually a few times in our study in John in in the morning. There is a disciple Philip, one of the original 12 disciples. But there is also another Philip that shows up, particularly in the book of Acts, as one of those initial seven who who were, were chosen out by the Jerusalem church to serve, to wait tables. And this is that Philip. In Acts chapter 6, he was commissioned to serve in the church at Jerusalem, and after serving for some time as a servant in Jerusalem, he became an evangelist in Caesarea. What is he doing as an evangelist in Caesarea? He's preaching the gospel. He is leading people to Christ. He's in a place where people haven't heard the good news or haven't fully understood the gospel that Jesus Christ died, he truly is the Messiah, that he died and rose again, has ascended back into heaven. And he's in Caesarea, and he's proclaiming that news to to people that didn't fully understand it or didn't even know it at all. And people were believing and coming to eternal life. Philip, incidentally, is that same guy who in Acts chapter 8 was preaching the gospel, evangelizing in Samaria, and the Spirit whisked him off to to the wilderness to come up alongside the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian is reading the scriptures. He doesn't understand what he's reading, and Philip jumps in the chariot, tries to help him to understand what what the scriptures are speaking about, leads the eunuch to Christ, and baptizes him. That's an evangelist, someone who reaches people who don't have a true understanding of the gospel and leads them to Christ. And when you think of an evangelist today, what comes to your mind? (laughs) It should be missionaries. Brother Earl knows where I'm going with this. We have come to think of an evangelist today as a guy who drives this this huge dually pickup diesel truck, and he travels with a 54-foot trailer behind him with six slide outs, and his wife and kids are behind him in a suburban following him along, and they're traveling from established church to established church, and what are they doing? They're preaching the word. And this is what we have thought an evangelist is. And I'm, as some have said, they blow in, they blow up, and then they blow out. Now, please don't mistake me. I'm not discounting or mocking a ministry like that. There is a place for it. But technically, we ought to refer to that ministry as being a ministry of revival. We ought to call that guy more of a, a revivalist, someone who's going to establish churches and, and stirring up the churches to go out and do ministry. That would technically be called a revivalist. Today, we call, what in a true sense of an evangelist, we today would call that person a missionary or maybe a church planter. Herb Hunter is an evangelist now. We have sent him to a place where there is not a church that is planted, and he is making contacts with unsaved people, and he is trying to preach the gospel to these people, and he's in the process of planting a church in a city that doesn't have one. And most of the missionaries that we support are evangelists in the true New Testament meaning of the word. They are preaching the gospel of Christ to those who don't know it and understand it properly, and people are believing their message. Now, the only other reference to evangelist in the New Testament is in the book of 2 Timothy. And I'm going to show you that verse in a moment, and there's a reason why I'm going to wait to show you that one. But notice the last gift, again in verse 11 of of Ephesians chapter 4. He gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now these two terms, pastor and teacher, are joined with the word and, and they refer to the same gift. 
There is not a pastor and then, and then another gift called a teacher. It is united in one by that word and that he is actually the pastor teacher. The word pastor means shepherd. And it's a great analogy of what a preacher ought to do. He ought to shepherd the people. Just as a, as, as a, as a shepherd will, will care for his sheep, he will guide his sheep, he will protect his sheep. So the pastor of a church ought to shepherd the people. He ought to lead them, he ought to love them, he ought to guide them, he ought to spend time with them, caring for them. And this picture is used elsewhere to describe the pastor in Acts 20 and in 1 Peter 5. He's a shepherd. But in both of the passages that provide for us the qualifications of a pastor, there is a qualification that a pastor must be able to teach. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, for instance, we discover that a pastor must be apt to teach. In the other place where we find the qualifications for a pastor in the book of Titus in chapter, uh, chapter, uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, we discover that a pastor must be able to hold fast the faithful word. He must be able to, the word that he's been taught, and he must be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So very simply, you cannot pastor a church if you can't teach the word of God. If you don't have the ability, the knowledge of the scriptures and the ability to communicate it effectively, you cannot shepherd a church. Now the opposite is possible. You might be able to teach very well, but not be able to pastor. It is very possible, and in fact, there are many people within this own, lo- this own body of believers that are very gifted teachers. Men and women both have the ability to understand the word of God and communicate it effectively. And there's a sense in which all of us ought to strive for that. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, the writer of Hebrews says, I wish all of you were teachers. I wish all of you were teachers, but you have need that one teach you. And several people in a given church can be effective teachers. And it would be great if all of us knew the word well enough that we could teach. But not everyone who can teach the word has the calling to shepherd a church. You understand that? But the opposite cannot be true. A pastor must be able to teach the word. And that's highlighted here in in Ephesians 4 verse 11 by uniting these two titles together into one gift saying he is the pastor teacher. It's a gift that Christ has given to the church. But you have four gifts here in verse 11. And the first two, the apostles and prophets, are foundational gifts that Christ has given to the er gave to the early church to establish it. And praise God for that. Isn't it a blessing that Christ gave apostles and prophets to the church? I mean, where would we be today, 2,000 years later, if this hadn't happened? What if we didn't have the New Testament? We are indebted to Christ for his triumph over sin and death and the grave, and that fact that he turned around and he gave gifts to the church, we are indebted to these apostles and prophets. But Christ is no longer providing these gifts for us. People claim to be apostles and prophets in the big A and the big P sense, but they are charlatans. Apostles and prophets don't exist today. The foundation is laid. The church is established. The New Testament has been canonized, and the gifts are no longer being given to the church today. But the second two, evangelists and pastor teachers, are gifts that Christ is still giving to the church today. And we ought to thank God for that as well, because these are given to the church for our health and well-being. Before we move on to verse 11, I think we would be helped by observing something here. Of these two gifts that Christ is still giving to the church, what really is the difference? What is the difference between the evangelist and the pastor teacher? And I want to show you. As we said, the evangelist is one who is going to other places where the gospel is not, and he's proclaiming it, and he's leading people to Christ, and generally he goes somewhere else. That's what we see Philip In Acts chapter 6, he's in Jerusalem serving in the church. In Acts chapter 8, he's in Samaria. Then he's off in the wilderness with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then in Acts 21, he's in another place, in Caesarea, planting churches, preaching the gospel. And the pastor teacher is the one who stays put. He stays in a church for a longer period of time, and he tries to build up already, already existing believers and disciple them. But you might say, shouldn't an evangelist nurture the church? And shouldn't a pastor teacher go out and evangelize lost people? And the answer is yes. And I told you there was one other reference to the evangelist in 2 Timothy. I want to show it to you now. Can you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 
4 for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Interestingly, 2 Timothy is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to who? <laughs> Timothy. And who's Timothy? Timothy is the pastor teacher of the church at Ephesus. He was preaching in the very church at, that we have been studying, the, the book of Ephesus. But towards the end of the letter, in chapter 4, Paul gives some final instructions to Timothy, who is the pastor teacher of the church at Ephesus, and notice what Paul says in verse 5. First, Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of a what? An evangelist. And so Paul is speaking to a pastor teacher, and he's saying to the pastor teacher, you need to evangelize. You need to go out and win lost people to Christ. And you say, wait a minute. I thought Timothy's supposed to be a pastor teacher. And he is. Christ gifted Timothy to the church at Ephesus to pastor them and to teach them the word of God. But Timothy was never to neglect the work of the evangelist. So back to Ephesians chapter 4. What is the difference today between the evangelist and the pastor teacher? And here's the difference. The difference is in focus. I, as your pastor teacher here, had better be spending the bulk of my time shepherding you and spending time in the Word of God so that I can effectively communicate the Word of God to you. But some of my time also ought to be out spent in the community preaching the, the, the gospel to lost people. Do you see that? Herb Hunter ought to be doing the exact opposite of me. Being in a place now, and our other missionaries, other church planters who are in other places where the gospel is not, the bulk of their time will be spent in evangelizing lost people, and some of their time will be spent in actually nurturing believers. Do you like charts? Let me show it to you this way. The focus of the pastor teachers here at FBC ought to be on discipleship of this existing congregation. This, this congregation has already been evangelized. There are all kinds of people in this church that have been saved. And the pastors, teachers here, the bulk of our time ought to be spent on discipleship. And some of our time ought to be spent in evangelism. But the focus of the evangelist is the exact opposite. The bulk of his time is to be spent in evangelism, reaching lost people with the gospel. And then some of his time is spent in discipleship. And these are leadership gifts that Christ has granted so graciously because of his triumph over sin and death. And note before we move on that these leaders are the gifts to the church. If you look back in Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 7 down to verse 11, there is a change in the receiver of the gift. Notice verse 7, it says, but unto every one of who is given grace? Every one of us. And then in verse 8, he gave gifts unto men. So the receiver is every believer. Every believer receives a gift. But then the receiver changes in verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. This, the, the, these gifts are actually given to the church. He's not necessarily talking so much about gifts that are given to the leaders of the church, but that the leaders themselves are gifts to the church. Now, if I were a hipster pastor and you were a hipster congregation, I might have started this service and I might have had Josh rig up something in a box. I might have been wrapped up in a big box with a bow on it, and I would have been dropped down from the ceiling to help you to understand that, that pastors are a gift that is given by Christ to the church. Now, I'm not a hipster pastor, and you're not a hipster congregation, and so I didn't do that tonight. But if I had, you probably would have remembered this principle forever. But there's nothing hipster about me. I was actually, this is totally, has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, but I was driving down the highway the other day and a van passed me, a minivan, a red minivan, just like my wife and I were just cracking up because this, this van bombed by us and the back of it says, I used to be cool. And I, I said, that's, that's me, that is totally me. But aren't you glad that Christ has overcome sin and death? And he has taken spoils from the battle, and he, he has saved people, he has freed people from the crutches, clutches of Satan, and then he has taken the spoils of victory, and he has given them back to the church. He has taken people who are in bondage to sin, people like me, and he has saved me, has transformed my life, and then he has, turned, given, he has gifted me back to the church to do ministry in the body. That's the provision of gifts. Notice, secondly, though, the purpose of gifts. Why did Christ give? 
give apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors, teachers. The purpose of the gifts is verse 12, but I'll go ahead and read verse 11. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why did he give them? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. There's a wonderful word, perfecting. It, it literally means preparing, mending, or restoring to proper use. A great illustration of this perfecting is, is found in, in both Matthew and Mark. When Jesus was calling to the disciples, do you remember what the disciples were doing? They were mending their nets. It's the same word perfecting. They were working on, these, on these, these nets that were largely intact, but there were a few holes in the nets, and they were fixing those holes. We can picture this kind of thing well here in, in the Maritimes. We understand what it is to mend nets. Many of you understand very well, well what it is to mend lobster traps. You are forever fixing those lobster traps and closing in the gaps so that everything will work properly and that you can get the maximum catch. That's essentially what the gifts that Christ has given to the church have done and still do today. In church ministry, you have a large quantity of things that are very much intact. You have people that are, that are following Christ, that are serving, that are zealously going about good works. You have ministries that are functioning well, but always throughout church life, there are holes that develop. People struggle. People fall into sin. Ministries sometimes are missing people that are vital in order to function the ministry well. And the pastors and teachers are given to Christ, by Christ to the church to keep mending those holes, to keep perfecting the saints. By the way, that's God's goal for you, you know, to be absolutely perfect. God wants this church, God wants you as an individual believer, nothing short of perfection. There's an arresting statement in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, he says, be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's God's standard for you. He wants absolute perfection. Paul, likewise, in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, says good, goodbye to the church of Corinth, and he says, finally, brethren, be perfect. Anybody there? Anybody claim to be perfect here tonight? I would love to meet you after the service. So what can this possibly mean to be perfect? How is this possible? Well, maybe Mary Poppins could be practically perfect in every way, but none of us are there. So what are these commands in the Bible to be perfect? If you were to study through the scriptures this word perfect, there are a couple of different words for it, but you learn a few things, and this is so helpful to see this. There are three kinds of perfection to which we are called. First, we, there is what we might call positional perfection. That is, we are positionally perfect. Hebrews 10 and verse 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Christ, by his substitutionary death on the cross, has forever perfected his people. This is otherwise known as justification. Jesus Christ took my sin upon himself, and he offered himself up to Christ as a sacrifice, and, and he has given me his robes of righteousness. He's my substitute. As the hymn we sing here says, complete in thee, no work of mine can take, dear Lord, the place of, my, my, of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and I am now what? Complete in thee. Perfect. We are perfect in Christ. He takes my imperfection, and I in turn take his perfection upon myself. That's justification. That's positional perfection. But there is also something that we look forward to, and that is final perfection, we could call it. We could consider another passage in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verse 23, that speaks of those who are in heaven, and he describes them as the spirits of just men made what? Perfect. This is what we call glorification. I am already positionally perfect in Christ, but one day I will be ultimately perfect in Christ. One day I will be finally complete. The hymn complete in thee continues, and when before the bar... All tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be, at thy right hand, complete in thee. And I am positionally perfect in Christ, but yet there is this final perfection, body and soul, when I will be like him when I see him as he is. Now what do I contribute to my positional perfection and my final perfection? Nothing. 
It has nothing to do with me. It is all the work of Christ that has made me positionally perfect and will finally make me perfect. But there is a third type of perfection that does have a human component to it, isn't there? And it is the practical perfection, we might call it. What is another name for that? If positional perfection is justification, if final perfection is glorification, what is this practical perfection? It's sanctification. Now, how does that happen? How do do I have something to do with sanctification? Is there a human element to sanctification? Absolutely there is. That is the kind of perfection that we are talking about in Ephesians 4. The saints, believers in Christ, are already positionally holy. That's what the word saints means. And the saints will be finally perfected, finally. Christ will see to that. He that began a good work will complete it at the day of Christ. Romans 8, those he justified, them he also glorified. But are the saints practically perfect today? Are you perfect? You're not. But how does it happen? It is a process. How do we we practically become perfected? Well, one of the ways, one of the gifts that God has given to you to help you on that path are these gifts. He has given the gifts, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Christ has gifted you as a church with pastor teachers who shepherd you and teach you the word of God. This is what God has rescued me to do. This is what Christ has liberated Pastor Bart and Pastor Andy to do. This is the the gift that he has given to you as a church to help you to be perfected. And we all ought to thank God for that. And we all ought to be clear on what the gift ought to be doing, how the gift ought to be functioning. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly, might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And when you have a church that understands clearly that her pastor teachers are a gift from God, not to baby them, not to boss them around, pardon the pun, not to entertain them, and not even to do all of the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is done by the entire body. But the church, is, Christ has given gifts to the, these gifts of pastor teachers to shepherd the people and to teach them the word of God. And when you have that happening, a church will bear fruit. Very quickly in closing, there are two things I can guarantee will happen if we have this dynamic going on, and we do, but if we continue to abound in this. Notice lastly the product of the gifts. Two products very simply at the end of verse 12. The body serves and the body grows. The body serves and the body grows. That's it. It's going to happen. Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If you like highlighting, these two products are as plain as plain can be. They both start with the word for in verse 12. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. For the work of the ministry. That is the work of the service in the local church. Verse 7, every believer has a gift. Christ has given every man a gift, and, and those gifts are to be used in service. And if evangelists have led people to Christ, and the church has been established, and pastor teachers are teaching people the word of God, people will overflow in service. And then what happens? For the edifying, at the end of verse 12, the building up of the body of Christ. We're going to grow. If we get this right, if we understand these gifts and how they are to function, if we do this the way that God has designed for us to do this, we are going to grow. If the pastors are leading and feeding the people and the people are constantly informed and encouraged about what they are to do and they overflow in service for the master, the body will grow. Growing is serving. We will be built up. What an amazing design that Christ has put together. What a gracious Savior that he is to come down to earth and to overcome sin and death and to deliver us from the, from, the, from the torment of Satan and to make us his slaves. And May God strengthen the pastors here to hold forth the word of God. May God strengthen the pastors of other churches to hold forth the word of God, to, to pastor the people. And may God enable FBC to abound in service that this body 
might be built up. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for these gifts. What an enlightening study this has been to to see at what great cost that these gifts have been acquired. What, What great cost that we have been delivered from the dominion of Satan, and we have been brought under your, your blessed yoke, your, under your dominion, under your lordship. Sin was just an awful taskmaster, and you have set us free from that, that we might be your slaves. I pray, Father, that each one of us will examine what it exactly it is that you have gifted us to do, and that you will guard any one of us in this room from being lazy or flippant about our gifts and not utilizing them in service. And I pray, Lord, that as leaders and as the entire body, as we minister together, as we function the way that you have designed for us to function, that you will keep true to your promise, and that you will perfect us, and that you will build up this body. May the God of all peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of his everlasting covenant, may he make us perfect in every good work to do his will working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Can we close uh, this time by just singing another song, just reminding us of this opportunity, opportunities that we have to serve and to go out and to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. That's really the context of Ephesians chapter 4. It's walking worthy in accordance with the weight of blessings that we have received, now overflowing in service throughout the week, just using the gifts that God has given uh, to, to impact this world and to bless one another. Would you stand and we'll sing this chorus, Walk Worthy of the Lord. Take two. Walk worthy of the Lord. Caleb Curtis, would you mind dismissing us in prayer, please? Tonight?